before I started medical school, um, I had a broader view of health and healing. And like Dr. Chang, that came a lot from my experience of yoga when I was a teenager. I found myself really fascinated with studying molecular biology and genetics in high school, and it seemed to be the most fun thing for me to learn. And then as I learned yoga, I learned about my body in a different way that wasn't so much science and textbook based, it was really experiential, and that really is what broadened my perspective beyond just um, the science approach um, and really understanding a more holistic concept of healing. So challenges to our current system. Well, we've had a sharp rise in complex chronic disease. So these are things like diabetes, heart disease, cancer is also considered a chronic disease. Also escalating costs on the system from these diseases and their treatments. What we have is a, an acute care model. So acute care means somebody has a symptom or something that cause, causes them to seek medical attention acutely, like right now, and then we're trying to apply a treatment or a fix as opposed to a different model, which we'll get into. We really do have a lack of resources allocated towards prevention and researching prevention specifically. It's a really very, very small portion of the budget, most of it going towards um, disease treatments and procedures. So what we really have right now is an epidemic of chronic disease. So around this circle are some of the causes, the root causes that have led to this epidemic of chronic disease, including chronic stress, sedentary lifestyles, both young and old people are, are very sedentary, nutrition, things about our food supply, about our soil, people's dietary habits and what's available and what's affordable. Uh, there's environmental toxicity, uh, uh, fragmented families and communities. In the picture as a family, but everyone's on their iPhone <laughs> and they're not talking to each other kind of a sign of the times, but these things are implicated in our health. And then we have indoor living. So we're, we, we're out in the sun and the outdoors a lot less nowadays, um, but being in the sunlight is very important for production of vitamin D. And even in children, there's, um, things, there's a, a condition that they're calling nature deficit disorder, and it overlaps a lot with attention deficit disorder. Uh, we have an aging population, which also contributes to chronic disease and also the levels of poverty. So I said I'd talk a bit more about toxins. So Canadian women's breast milk is widely contaminated. Breast milk tends to concentrate things. And when I first read this study, I was thinking, oh no, people are gonna stop breastfeeding and that's a bad idea. And, I, and that is a bad idea for a lot of other reasons. But it's just again going to show that these chemicals and pollutants are persistent. They, they pass through food chains and they persist in the environment. So it, it is a problem. Now there's a pie chart. This is looking at the proportional mortality or percent of total deaths, all ages, um, for various conditions. Cardiovascular disease is a fairly big chunk, almost a third. Cancers is another big chunk. And then we've got respiratory diseases, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, asthma, um, diabetes, and then other uh, non-communicable diseases or NCDs. So, a very large portion of this is chronic disease uh, contributing to death. And not only is it a problem in terms of causing more death, but it's also a burden on the healthcare system just from the numbers. Under behavioral risk factors, we've got, for a few examples, physical activity. 34% of men are physically inactive, 37% of women. Tobacco smoking, still we have about 15% of men smoking, 11% of women smoking. Obesity is another big one. 26% of Canadian men are obese, 26% of women are obese. These are all risk factors for chronic disease, so it is, it is a real uh, burden and problem. Also, we have escalating costs. This is another problem, and I've chosen um, Alzheimer's as an example. So in 2012, the total cost of Alzheimer's is $200 billion, and the projected cost in 2050 is $1.1 trillion annually, so 5.4 million people in 2012 have Alzheimer's in the US and that's projected to increase to 16 million. By There's a quotation here which I'll read. We have to find better ways of dealing with Alzheimer's disease, either through finding better treatments or through finding better ways of taking care of people with the disease that are more efficient and cost effective. And when I read this, it just stuck out to me. I thought there's a problem with this because nowhere is prevention mentioned. So it's really not on the agenda. 
If chronic disease was prevented, this would be the cost that could be avoided. The yellow bars are lost economic output, so that's people not working, people out of the workforce because of chronic disease. And then the blue bars, which are also increasing steadily, is treatment expenditures. So you can see there's just this projected real rise in costs. And then finally, this is data from Ontario. And it's showing pharmaceuticals are one of the top costs in our healthcare system and their costs are continually rising as more and more drugs and more expensive drugs are used to treat all these chronic diseases that people are living with and living for a long time with. So I would argue that prevention is something we really ought to be looking at. In British Columbia, healthcare is approaching about 50% of the provincial budget. So with all this said, do we have a healthcare system or do we have a disease care system? So this slide, paradox. So on the left side, we have conventional treatment, somebody having coronary artery bypass surgery, so it's open heart surgery, and uh, very invasive. There's a lot of perioperative morbidity, mortality, infections, all kinds of things that can go on. But it is conventional treatment in the setting of heart disease, whereas on the right-hand side, we have an unconventional treatment, which is meditation. 43% risk reduction in all-cause mortality, heart attack, and stroke, and it was investigated in a study. Now, the study population was at-risk men in the United States. But just to show, we have great data for unconventional treatments, but they're not really being incorporated as much as we'd like to see them be. So this is an image that kind of depicts what our healthcare system right, is right now. Our critical care, taking up the majority, the emergency departments are plugged, and that's really the majority of where the costs and resources are going right now. For this is what we would like to see, prevention as the foundation, and then primary care in the middle, and then acute care and more reactive care on the top as the smallest piece. So ology silos, so this is more to talk about our current system. So we have all these ologists, respirologists, nephrologists, gastroenterologists, cardiologists, you name it. There's many different specialty areas and they all have gone to school for quite a long time to become very uh, proficient in a certain organ system in the body, which has a lot of merits. I mean, I'm sure many of you have seen a specialist and probably had good help from the specialist in the past. So I'm not arguing against this model, but this model very much excels in diagnosis and treatment of disease. Where in reality, this shows all these interacting points and lines that represent systems biology. And this is the reality of what is happening in the human organism, in any ecosystem in the world. There's always this homeostasis, homeodynamic balance actually, and things are interacting. They're not in these little narrow silos separate from each other. So you might go to see a gastroenterologist because you have heartburn or reflux. And the gastroenterologist may prescribe you a medication like a, called a proton pump inhibitor. And this tells the cells of your stomach to stop secre secreting as much acid. So the symptom goes away. You actually feel better now because you don't have as much acid there anymore. Great, the gastroenterologist has done his job and you're feeling better. By introducing that proton pump inhibitor and changing the pH balance in the gastrointestinal tract, you're affecting the environment in which all the microorganisms in your gut grow. So then this person, starts to notice they're developing some strange arthritic type symptoms and their family doctor refers them off to a rheumatologist. And the rheumatologist says, hmm, well you've got some sort of inflammatory arthropathy, it's not quite rheumatoid arthritis, but here let's put, try you on this medication to, um, to fix that. So again, it's a very specialized area and another medication on top of the other. So this is the type of thing we see when we've got these narrow silos of thinking as opposed to this complex interaction. Health is a continuum. There is optimal wellness or optimal health. And then there's disease on the other side of the spectrum. And then there's sort of this middle place where you may not have any symptoms, but really the things going on that are out of balance in the body over time can lead to disease. So that's what we're really yeah. focusing on here a lot with people is finding out where those imbalances are and trying to correct them before it leads to the far end of the spectrum. And another thing about our, the integrative approach is to talk about curing versus healing. We certainly think that curing is a really good objective. You know, people want to cure their disease. The thing about curing, though, is it's not always possible. You know, often with this as our objective, what it means is we're really trying to stamp out things, eradicate them, or even just stamp out symptoms so that the symptoms go away. But there might actually still be something going on underneath. Healing 
uh, is something where it's a broader, it's a broader picture, picture approach. So healing is to restore balance, to restore wholeness, and can really happen despite the persistence of an illness or even in the face of death, healing can happen. I just like this quote. We thought we could cure everything, but it turns out we can only cure a small amount of human suffering. The rest of it needs to be healed. Now, Hippocrates, he relates to this as well. A wise man should consider that health is the greatest of human blessings and learn how, by his own thought, to derive benefit from his illness. So healing a person is often a profound opportunity. It's not viewed in the negative. It's an opportunity for growth. It's an opportunity to get to know yourself better and to make some changes in your life. And we hear it all the time. People um, improve their health and they embark on this healing journey. To speak a little bit more as to why change is needed, there is rising dissatisfaction both amongst patients and amongst uh, family doctors. I'm worried that healthcare has become too impersonal, doc. No, just relax and lie back on the bar scanner. <laughs> There is a consumer demand for alternatives. 12.4% of Canadians and 15% of Canadians with asthma visited a complementary and alternative practitioner. So that would be someone like a naturopath, Chinese medicine practitioner. And 85% of people with advanced cancer use complementary and alternative medicine. So it's actually, they're actually stepping out beyond and actually paying to see someone other than a conventional doctor. So those numbers might look small, but they're actually quite significant. So why we need a new paradigm, again, or escalating chronic disease, an acute disease-centered model that's reactive as opposed to a preventive model, over-reliance on costly and invasive technologies, and a specialty-based silo model that's not com complex enough to really address what's going on in systems biology. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Chang.